are watching the Jenny Lynn Show, and I am Jenny Lynn Cleave, your host. And tonight, my guest is a historian, Mr. Anthony Powell. Since last month, February, was Black History Month, I thought it would be great to have someone who is an expert on black history and was privileged when he consented to come on the show and tell us about his role in black history. Thank you for coming to the Jenny Lynn Show. It's a pleasure to be here. I guess I shouldn't say your role in black history, but maybe you can <laughs> share with us your journey. Well, I guess it's a role in black history. Okay. Uh, I was privileged uh, to be raised by my grandparents. Okay. My grandfather was a soldier for 40 years. Wow. He joined the Army in 1887. Uh, retired in 1927. Wow. Uh, he lived to be 105 years old, died in 1979. But I was able to learn from him and the old soldiers that lived around him uh, about what became my life's work, you know, keeping and recounting their history. So over the last 45 years, that is what I've been doing. And, you know, what makes it so unique and so interesting, you can pick up books, and there have been many books written uh, dealing with uh, black military history, uh, very few actually by black authors. And the most different thing is that you will have an overview of accounts, but you don't have a first-person narrative right. of what these men felt like. So for 45 years, I've been documenting I interviewed many of these men before they passed on. I had an opportunity of getting in my library their letters, their diaries. Wow. And I interviewed so many of them that gave me a view of their life that the history books did not show. What an awesome experience that must have been for you. Well, it was. It was. I grew up watching television watching the movies and all of the heroes, military heroes I saw was John Wayne. And don't get me wrong, I still watch John Wayne movies to this day because I thought it was, they were great. Right. You know, but never during that time did I see any black soldiers. And the reality of the American West after the Civil War that one in five soldiers in the American Army was black. Right. And 85% of the battles fought, ironically and unfortunately, against Native American people were not done by John Wayne, they were done by black soldiers. Right, they were the Buffalo Soldiers. And they were the Buffalo Soldiers. Yeah. And that's a name that has come down over the years. It was given to them by Native Americans as a title of respect. Uh, if you are familiar with Native culture, the Buffalo represents the totality of life. It was used as food, as clothing, as medicine. Uh -huh. And so you wouldn't give your sacred name just to anyone who was oppressing you. And ironically, black soldiers at that time were oppressing Native Americans in that they kept them on their reservations. Okay. But through my 45 years of research, what I have not found is not one occasion of indiscriminate killing of Native Americans by these black soldiers. Even though as warriors they fought them and they did kill some. But they didn't have the attitude of your average American to the cliche, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. <laughs> These soldiers did not have that, you know, right. in their vocabulary. Well, I was reading today because until today, I have to admit, I did not know what the Buffalo Soldier was or where the name came from. I'll ask you to talk about that in a few minutes. But I discovered that they made more money, they made $13 a day. And that's the only time they got to make that much money. It was actually $13 a month. Right. That's right. I'm so used right. to hourly rates now. Right. Yes, it was $13 a month. Could you imagine? Well, I mean, you know, that was a, you know, think in terms of 150 years ago. And $13 a month in currency of that time uh, was not bad, was not a bad living. But you have to think about the black soldier. Well, why did he enlist in the Army? Was it because he was patriotic and he just wanted to do all these things for the government? Of course not. He enlisted in the Army because the Army gave him something that outside of its structure they couldn't get. I interviewed my grandfather, and he served in the Indian Wars. And I asked him in the late 50s, I said, Granddad, why did you join this racist country's army? You know, my grandfather told me something I never forget. 
He said, the army gave me the only part of the American dream that the nation would let me share in. Now, my first response was, oh, God, granddad's an Uncle Tom. But it took me a decade or two to fully appreciate the fact that the Army, my grandfather was a totally illiterate country boy from Tennessee. If you had known him before he died, you would have thought at least he had a master's degree. The Army educated him. The Army gave him monetary security, that $13 a month. Right. Okay, it gave him a career that spanned 40 years something outside the structure of the military for people of color at that time that was a rare thing to have amazing so could you tell me i know but for my viewers a lot of people aren't sure what this buffalo soldier really is i mean i know bob marley or someone sang a song about that right. and that's when i first became familiar with it but to be honest i never researched what it really was well so it could was you speak to what a buffalo soldier sure. is it was what Native Americans called black soldiers. And they had a couple of names for them. They would call them brunettes. They would call them black white man. Okay. <laughs> uh, but the, the name that stuck was buffalo soldiers. Okay. Folklore says it was because of the buffalo robes that they wore and the curly hair represented the mat of the sacred animal, the buffalo. But the fact of the matter was there was a warrior clan of the Cheyenne that was called the Clan of the Buffalo Warrior, and only the fiercest warriors were allowed in that clan. So when they ran across my grandfather's generation of soldiers, these were fierce warriors likened to the Buffalo Clan, ergo Buffalo Soldier. Uh-huh. So that's how it got its name. And that's how it got its name. And it's lasted uh, to the time that horses were taken away from the army. So you became a black historian, and your focus was the Buffalo Soldier. Right. My focus was the Buffalo Soldiers, but my degrees are in ancient history. Oh, okay. I was a Roman history buff and historian, and my field was the Roman Empire. Um, it was due to my grandfather and those older people that I grew up around mm -hmm. that I decided that I had to tell their story a story that wasn't being told. And it's true, the last 40 years, there have been some very good books by personal friends of mine, you know, that have begun telling the story of these soldiers. But I think I have the uniqueness in that I give you their story in their words. First hand. Right. So the interviews that you did with them, did you just write them or do you have them documented well, on I tape? I was or? one of the first ones to use film in interviewing my grandfather and some of his friends. How awesome. And if I didn't have that, I would take a tape recorder with me and I would tape them because I couldn't remember everything they would tell me. Um, so yeah, I, I have those interviews still on film, you know, to this day. Well, they're on big tapes. <laughs> but That's really I, I amazing. Yeah. So would you say that your grandfather was one of the most influential people in your life? or the most influential? He was one of the most okay. influential okay. in my life. Yes. You know, simply because, uh, you know, if you look at how my grandfather uh, was raised, he was an orphan, raised in Tennessee. Um, when he joined the Army in uh, 1887, um, you know, he said there was nothing else for me to do on the farm, so he had to get away, and that was his only way of escaping and seeing or being more than what he was allowed to be, you know, in his youth. You're telling me he was an orphan, and my mind is going to an orphanage back in the 18th century. I can't even fathom what that was like. Well, for in, in my grandfather's case in Tennessee, there, there were really no orphanages, but people would take these orphan kids and would raise them as their own. And he just happened to be, you know, selected and, you know, helped share crop a farm in, in Tennessee until he was 13 when he decided that he had to get out on his own and he left. And that was back in the time of slavery, right? No, that was after slavery. Oh, My grandfather the joined the Army in 1887 okay. at 13 years old. Okay. He was a big guy. He uh -huh. wasn't a little guy. Right. Yeah. And for 40 years, that was his life. So tell me about the museum. You're a curator. Tell me about the black soldier, the black the Buffalo Soldier well, Museum. We did an exhibit 
that uh, traveled the country for 13 years called Buffalo Soldier. Okay. And the venues that we had were some of the best museums, um, you know, in the nation and some of the best universities in the nation. So the whole idea of the exhibit was to tell the story that, in my opinion, had not been given its just due. And mm -hmm. so that, that is what we did. And so when people viewed my exhibit, and I'll tell you something that was ironic. Uh, for the 13 and a half years that the exhibit traveled, it was seen by over a million people. Wow. And 85% were white. Okay. That's Why do you think that is? Well, I guess for some of us, museums are something that's not important. Okay. But I feel that the story is an American story. So it's for all of Americans, irregardless of their ethnic background. Right. So when I designed my exhibit, I designed it for when people go through, they would ask the question or say, I didn't know that. I want to learn more. And so what we've accomplished, you've shared something unique for them, and you whet their appetite for more learning. Mm -hmm. And you have a place here? Where is the museum? The uh, I have no museum here. The okay. closest Buffalo Soldier Museum is in Houston, Texas. Okay. And I helped them quite a bit when they were establishing their museum. And it's a very, very nice museum in Houston. I bet they, it they is. They did a wonderful job. So you were lecturing at the University of I've Arizona? lectured at, um, well, I taught at the University of Northern Arizona. Okay. I've lectured at uh, Yale, Princeton, West Point. Wow. Um, universities up and down the peninsula here. Impressive. You know, on the subject of black military history. Mm -hmm. And what do you, what have you learned over the years as a university lecturer in this field that you would say shows that we have either advanced or Something that you could see has been a change from then. Well, the biggest change was my grandfather's generation uh, were segregated, mm -hmm. you know, into units, black units and white units. I mean, it, it wasn't 100% because you could find black and white soldiers serving in the same units, but not on the big scale, you know, that the regular army had it in. But what I've seen over the years is a change. Okay, and yes. it was a change that took place um, over 150 years. Uh, from the end of the Civil War, my grandfather's generation joined the Army because the Army offered them an eight to five, a career with the benefit of retirement at the end of it. If you ask a black soldier today why he enlisted, or let me put it that way, this way, if you ask a soldier of color today and ask them why they enlisted in the military, they would tell you the same thing my grandfather said 120 years ago. Because of opportunity. The Army gave me a part of the American dream. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what we have seen that has taken place, you have black officers, you have people like Colin Powell, you know, who was the chief of staff, and you have many generals in the Army, the Air Force, admirals in the Navy that are people of color. And I think that that shows that we as a nation even though we went through those formulative years of segregation, but we changed. We're going through a big election cycle now when, you know, change in America is coming again. But I, yeah. I try to look at it from a positive perspective. Right. Can we go back 50 or 100 years ago? We can't go back, and we're not going to go back. America today is a place of color. People from all over the literal globe live here in America. Why do you think then there's so much black and white? It's always about black and white. Because there's so many other colors. Some, you know, some of it is human nature, mm -hmm. okay, uh, to look down on one or to look up at another. Uh, but I think the bottom line, you know, something that, I've, that, that I have learned uh, in, in almost 70 years of life is that when it comes time to blaming, blaming anyone for anything, I look in the mirror mm -hmm. and I look at that reflection that points back to me. Mm -hmm. You know, the buck stops there. Mm -hmm. All right. So if I'm going to make change, what do I have to do first? I have to change myself. Right. 
And I think we as Americans have to go through a metamorphosis of changing ourselves. And I think we have, you know, over the last 200 years, you know, but we still have a lot of work to do. And I think that we can, I know we can do it. Well, I know that you're a historian and we're talking about the past because that's what history is. But what do you think about the craziness that's going on in this in our political world right now. Well, I mean... And I'm sorry to use that adjective, but from my perspective, that's how it appears. Well, it seems like it, but, you know, an, an ancient person said once, we live in interesting times. Mm -hmm. Today in America, in 2016, we live in very interesting times. Are we as a nation, as a people, going to revert and go back 50 or 100 years? I think not. Right. You know, I think that we are such a unique nation and country in our universe this earth um, that will stay the storm and that will continue to progress and move forward. So, you know, you have those people here for a minute and they'll be gone and you'll be wondering, who were they? How did they get here? <laughs> right. Yeah. But they might make it in your history museum. They might. <laughs> they might. So why or what is preventing you from having one here in California? Because we can only hear about it. But, you know, the black people here, the black soldiers here, would be interested in seeing your exhibits, I'm sure. There are a lot of people, not just black, but people of all different races yes. would love seeing, you know, a, an exhibit here. The biggest problem is called dinero, money. money. Mm -hmm. You know, to put on something like that, it, it just requires a lot of money. We live in an area today where, <laughs> unless you're a multimillionaire, or unless you have someone with big pockets, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to do. Over the 40 plus years that I've done things, everything that's been paid for has been paid for basically out of my pocket. Okay. Um, and to do something that I would like to see done, I don't think I have another 70 years. You know, so you have to leave it to people that will view this program right. and feel that this is something that needs to last through time to pick up the torch and run. What was the thing that impressed you the most as you've been going along the journey of the Buffalo Soldier and all the historical chapters you've been covering? What's impressed you the most and why? I guess what's impressed me the most is the black soldier himself. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the times of the Indian Wars to Afghanistan, my time in Vietnam, my grandfather's time oh, you fighting, went to war in Vietnam. fighting Native Americans to my father's generation in World War II. One of the things about the black soldiers that, that I've always found that was interesting that impressed me was their ability to get along with indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I think that that is something that speaks volumes for these men. You know, my grandfather's generation that went to the Philippines at the turn of the century and, you know, those that went uh, through the, the other Pacific Islands and France during World War I and World War II, you know, they had the ability to empathize and really get along with the people of the nations that they were there fighting. Would you, so you are a Buffalo soldier, too. Not a Buffalo soldier. No, I can't say that. <laughs> you can't. I just happened to be, you know, in at a time when it wasn't the best of times. Did you actually go to a, uh, were you actually on a war path? Well, they say Vietnam was a war place, and yes. So you were on the battlefield? Yeah. Oh, wow. Because yeah. a lot of people tell me they were in, they were involved at the mm -hmm. time, but they weren't actually at the battlefield. Yeah. So how much of what you knew from covering all of the history came in to help you while you were on the battlefield? Not if a lot. anything, nothing. Not a lot. Okay. Because what you try to do in a situation like Vietnam is you, you're trying to survive. Okay. Um, and that was a horrible situation that for the first time, um, we weren't the heroes. Okay. The people didn't think that we were the heroes. Mm -hmm. And coming from a generation that had been brought up on John Wayne and we Americans are the, you know, the heroes all the time to realize that, God, we had to do things that we were not supposed to do. But in order to survive, we did. What left, what indelible mark was left from that war? 
that's affected your life, either positive or negative? Not Anything? really. Anything? Did I survive with everything intact? Mm -hmm. Mainly my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we hear so much about post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, and you know, when the troops came back from Vietnam, there were no parades. They came back. I mean, you were in Vietnam on a Tuesday, and you're back in the world on a Wednesday midnight. And instead of coming to people, you know, with signs saying, great job, this and that, we came with people saying, you baby killers, spitting at you and all of that stuff. Are so you the first thing you did was got out of your uniform and <laughs> Hid. made it back home, you know, yeah. And that was the reality of coming back from Vietnam. It's only been recently that the Vietnam veteran has gotten any of the kudos, you know, that uh, our brothers and sons and grandfathers got. How then can they come back and integrate back into society? It's very difficult. Jeez. Yeah, it, it's a very difficult situation. And you look at the homeless, uh, no matter where you go in this country, you'll, you'll find a good percentage of them are, are veterans. I know, it makes me very sad. Yeah. So what do you think we need to do? What type of reform is necessary? you have any ideas? Not really. Mm -hmm. Not really. I don't want to get you in trouble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not really. We'll skip over that one. <laughs> so what, what would you like to say that I haven't asked you about that's important along your journey as a historian? The most important thing is that history can repeat itself. Mm -hmm. if we are not aware of what has happened in the past. And so the job of a historian is to tell the story right. from an unbiased perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, And over the years, that's what I've tried to do. And so when I can tell the story from my grandfather's perspective, you know, from his eyes or my grandmother's eyes or the eyes of these other people that I've interviewed, you know, then I've, then I've done a pretty good job of helping to maintain um, what they were as a people. Because today, you talk to a lot of high school kids or middle school kids, and they have no clue you know, as to what our grandparents went through. And sure, they can tell you about slavery. And they say, oh yeah, we were slaves, but there was a time we weren't slaves. And what did we have to struggle through to make who you are today? So even after the abolition of slavery, black people were still very repressed back in those very days? Very repressed. That's, that's a mild way of putting it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the only time you really had a voice or a life is if you, involved, you got yourself enrolled. Um, to work as... It as all depends on where you were. Mm -hmm. And if you were fortunate enough you know, to be in a circumstance that helped. The military helped my grandfather's generation, you know, money, ec economics, a place to keep their family, okay, and all of those wonderful things. Was your grandfather one of those people who got $13 a month? Sure he was, $13 a month. And when he became a sergeant, he got $26 a month. <laughs> and you know, in 1941, right before World War II started, a private in the United States Army was only making $21.75 a month. But back then, that went a long way, right? Because you could get well, stuff for 50, a penny. 50, 60 years before, <laughs> it went a long way, too. What type of lifestyle did that afford your grandfather? I mean, I'm sure well, you were privy to that. Well, the military gave him the opportunity of uh, doing something that he always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. He got an education, mm -hmm. okay? My grandfather not only got an education, but he traveled literally around the world. And that was something that, uh, you know, he enjoyed doing, telling stories. He and my grandmother met in 1899, right after the Spanish-American War. Okay. And she fell in love with this handsome black guy because he was handsome like me. You know. I can tell. She fell in love with him. Did you get some good looks from him? Of course. <laughs> him and her. Okay. Um, you know, she fell in love with him. And she did something that her parents said was foolish. She married him. My grandmother was a German Jew. Oh, that that's immigrated to this country in 
1890 to Brooklyn, met my grandfather in 1899, fell in love, married him, and they were married for 75 years. Is that where you got the blue eyes? Um, probably. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's great. Back yeah. then, that was really frowned upon. Wasn't well, it, it was. I mean, she was disowned by her family. Really? Uh, oh, literally disowned by her family. But they were together for 75 years. They traveled, you know, different military camps together. Uh, they raised their children together. One interesting story my grandfather was at Fort Huachuca in Arizona mm -hmm. in 1927. In 1920, they knew that he was going to retire in a couple of years. So, um, my grandmother bought a home in Los Angeles. Now, once my grandfather retired and showed up at the home, the neighbors were in arms and sued my grandmother. And my grandmother won her sued, your sued her for not letting them know that she is married to a person of color. Yeah. They had lawyers back then? Of course they, they did have lawyers <laughs> back then. Yeah, but, oh my but they, you know, she won her case and, you know, they lived in that house until they passed away. And where was it? That was in Los Angeles. Oh, they lived so. here in California? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, how many children did they have? They had four boys and two girls. Uh-huh, and you're the offspring of one of those four people? Offspring of one of the girls. I see. Yeah. Yeah. What a great story. Why, well, thank you. I think it's wonderful that love can transcend all. It doesn't, doesn't matter the generation and all the prejudices. If you truly love someone, you can go against the odds. Oh, absolutely. For that absolutely. relationship. And your grandparents are a good example yeah. of this. And then what they taught me was very important. They taught me never to be ashamed of who I am. So we're down to one minute. All Sorry, right. don't mean so to cut you up. What do you want to leave with the viewers before I wrap um, this up? If you get an opportunity, you can go to the library, pick up books. You can even see some of these soldiers. I probably have the largest collection in the country, but um, take your time to look into who these men were. Thank you so much for watching The Jenny Lynn Show. And once again, I brought you another fascinating person. I hope you've enjoyed his story as much as I have. And do the research if you need to find out more about this. And you can go to my website, uh, gian2911 at gmail.com if you'd like more information from Anthony. Thank you right. so much Thank you for, for coming to me. this show. Right. Thank you. Thank you.